of angels, God betrayed by destiny and shorn of praises. O oh, first of exiles, who endurest wrong, yet growest in thy hatred, still more strong. O oh, fallen God, driven out of the skies, in strange and hidden places thou dost dwell. Diablos Deus, ut libros me. Asmodeus, prince of the power of the air, come forth and protect this circle from all perils approaching from the east. Leviathan, prince of the powers of water, come forth and protect this circle from all perils approaching from the south. Balial, prince of the powers of fire, come forth and protect this circle from all perils approaching from the west. Lucifer, prince of the powers of the earth, Come forward. Protect this circle from all perils approaching from the north, O Lord of Light. desire I possess. Is there anything that you would not do for me? No. Then take my hand. seventies I was the high priest of a Los Angeles based occult group, much like the one you have just seen. I worked as a professional psychic and instructed others in the development of their psychic power. Under the name Helias, I was personal advisor and confidant to many celebrities. During that time, I appeared on many radio and television programs performing much of the same phenomena we will be seeing and discussing today. At that time, these practices were referred to as the occult. Today, the term New Age has come to describe the same phenomena. 
Now the words and terminology are different, but all that has really changed are the costumes. I heard about him from a friend. Did you know that he was a high priest of Wicca and studied in India? They say he knows the pathway to power. It's always rewarding to greet a new group of travelers on the pathway of enlightenment. It has been said the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. I'm happy to see you take that step. Since time immemorial, there have been reports of mystics and great spiritual teachers who have shown evidence of being able to see and even read without the use of their eyes. The way my first teacher explained this feat to me is that each cell in the body contains a small part of every other cell. And through intense yoga training, the ocular properties of the cells of the fingertips could be developed. This means that a person with the power could actually see with his fingertips. A new age variation on this is to summon or channel a spirit guide. This disembodied spirit could then read what was on the paper in front of the channeler and communicate the contents. Will two of you come forward to assist me in a demonstration of sightless vision? Now would the rest of you write a brief question or statement about something of which I could have no possible prior knowledge? sure if you will be changing jobs soon or not, but I hope you get what you want. John, I don't know if you'll be moving back east or not, but while you're here, I hope you enjoy yourself. Phoenix, your name gives you your answer because the phoenix bird rises out of the ashes anew. You ladies would help me with my table and chair. Thank you. Now here we find some of the tools and objects associated with New Age studies. Crystals, tarot cards, astrology charts, and various sundry books. Also, a collection of spoons. Now, silverware isn't something that immediately comes to mind when we think of paranormal phenomena. But I'm sure many of you are familiar with the practice of psychokinesis, particularly the feats performed by Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic. Geller has given many demonstrations of his ability to affect inanimate objects through the powers of his mind. For instance, the bending of spoons. I will once again ask that two of you assist me. Please choose one of the spoons. Okay. Now just verify that it, that's a normal spoon, normal silverware. Appears to be. Excellent. Now I want you to hold it between your index finger and your thumb at the very end, and I want you to hold it between your index finger and thumb at the very end, okay? And just put your uh, elbows into your side, 
Okay, so you can hold it. Thank you. Now three things are going to happen. Number one, I want you to concentrate and become one to make a mental connection with the spoon. The next thing is I want you to think of a, an emotional experience in your life. Uh, some kind of, uh, it could be tragic, it could be exciting, happy, but something that was a very strong peak emotion. And at the proper time when I feel the energy, I will shout bend, and hopefully will uh, affect psychokinesis. Okay? Excellent. <coughs> Have you made mental contact? Okay. I want you to concentrate on that experience. Bend, 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 bend. Oh. <laughs> wow. Excellent. You may keep them for souvenirs if you wish. If I could ask both of you to remain up here with me for a moment. Excellent. Many masters show the inability to direct this mental power inwardly to speed up, slow down, or even stop their heart. If I could ask you please to take my pulse. Okay, just take two fingers and place it over my pulse there. Excellent, just lightly so you'll be able to pick it up. And if you would please be careful because there's a microphone, we've rigged it up so the people in the audience can hear it. Put those in your ears, and I'm gonna place this on my heart Okay, now I want you to take your left hand and place it over mine so that you're aware of the fact that uh, I'm not pulling it away, okay? okay? All right. Do you have a beat? Yes, okay. I do. Do you have a beat? Yeah. Can you hear beat. it? Your beat. Excellent. Still? It's gone. I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything. It's back. <laughs> Where'd you go? You're back. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you both very much. You may return to your seats. We have all heard of the mysterious inner power called chi, prana, kundalini, or serpent power, with which masters are able to use their powers of their minds to affect or even negate the natural laws of physical science, to perform, if you will, a miracle. I've enlisted our friend Charles' able assistance in this portion of our presentation for reasons which will soon become obvious. Charles? We've just seen an outward manifestation of this power. Now we're going to turn that power inward. Would you come up for a moment to help me? Please turn the lamp on. Turn the lamp off and remove the bulb. Now place it inside the plastic bag. Now break the bulb. Go ahead. Excellent. Now reach inside and choose a piece and hand it to me.
Thank you. You may return to your seat. I want you to pass this among you to make sure and verify for yourself that it is a broken light bulb. Fire, one of the most powerful and destructive forces of nature. I've asked Dr. Richard Fales to join us to take a closer look at firewalking and other new age phenomena. Today, firewalking is one of the primary ways a teacher has of giving his students first-hand proof that they are making significant progress in their psychic studies. After a certain amount of training in concentration and deep meditation techniques, the guru or mystic uh, may tell the students that he or she is now advanced enough to use their powers to walk barefoot over a bed of red hot coals. That's right, Richard. Uh, now let's take a look at some of the footage of the last time I personally exercised this power. Oh, that's impressive. Uh, as uh, you said earlier, these people have come here today as travelers on the pathway to enlightenment. But come on, John. Haven't you, in fact, just been leading them down the yellow brick road? Well, Richard, since you put it that way... Isn't it true that anyone can do these things you've just demonstrated? That's absolutely correct. Then none of the feats we have witnessed required any psychic training or mystical powers whatsoever. Richard, every single thing I just demonstrated can be explained by way of something that the folks in the New Age either will not accept or refuse to look for in the first place, a reasonable explanation. All right, but uh, what about the firewalk we just saw? How do you explain that? First, let's see what two prominent figures in the New Age movement have to say about firewalking. Firewalking is just uh, um, an ancient uh, um, game, basically, to, to test your level of belief. And they used it also in some of the ancient uh, Hawaiian cultures, that if there was a robbery or there was a, a crime in a, in a village, then they would have all of the men in the village walk the coals, and the guilty one would fall and be burned. I know that a lot of people attribute firewalking to lots of other uh, phenomena. The, the certain physicists will say that 
that uh, the, the coals are really uh, quite cool and, and that nothing's really happening. Uh, of course, I say that if that were true, then 30% uh, of them wouldn't have burns um, and 3% wouldn't be hospitalized. So uh, then, then there's other models where people call in spirits to, to help them get across the fire. I say that it's, if you've ever firewalked, it's much like a PK party. There's the same steps are involved. You, your intention is to get across the fire without being burned. The, believe me, there's a lot of peak emotional event involved right before you take that let go step to walk across the flames. Uh, so if you think about it for a few minutes, you realize all the same steps for performing psychokinesis or mind over matter are there for firewalking, just as in metal bending and applications to life, right? like um, achieving your goals. So which of these explanations is correct? Actually, none of them. There is a definite technique, but it doesn't involve any supernatural hocus pocus. In fact, contrary to popular belief, hot coals are a lousy conductor of heat. If you will notice, no one ever walks across a sheet of hot metal. The coals I walked this time were in excess of 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. If you heat a sheet of metal to that temperature and tried to walk across it, it would take the bottoms of your feet off. The secret, Richard, is very simple. You take no more than four or five steps across the coals at approximately one second per step. So do the people who perform this feat all approach it the same way? Absolutely, and within those parameters. Still, 10 to 30 percent of the folks who attempt this receive some type of burn or blister. So the explanations we were just given by New Age folks were... Well, let's be kind and, and say they were inaccurate. Many of these folks and thousands of others have been deceived by this monumental hoax. I think we can finally say without qualification that a person so inclined can take a few steps across some hot coals. But burnt feet or not, it won't prove your innocence in a modern court of law and it certainly won't get you any closer to God. So what about walking on broken glass? I take it that that won't help either? No, sorry Richard. Let me get you to help me answer this. Have you ever walked uh, barefoot outdoors and stepped on a pebble and it hurt? Sure, uh, who hasn't? Yet you can easily walk barefoot down a gravel path. You see, Richard, if you step on a piece of glass, you've got a problem. However, by walking on a bed of glass, it's like the yogi lying on his bed of nails. It's simply weight distribution. If you'll notice, the boxes I use are a couple of inches deep and filled to the top. If you don't have a good thick layer of well-packed glass, you stand a chance of the glass shifting around and you simply get cut. It's happened to me on occasion. So once again, no magic. No magic. All right, how about your sightless vision? Well, you remember I gave you two possible explanations, but I'm sure you didn't buy either the disembodied spirit or the seeing fingertip story. The simple truth is I could read those papers because I could see them. How? The adhesive tape holding my eyelids shut, not being very adhesive despite its name, coupled with the perspiration on my eyelids under the tape, pads, bandage, and blindfold, allows me to open my eyes and simply look down my nose onto the table in front of me. As you can see here, I'm running my fingertips over the subject as if this is how I'm reading it. The movement of my hands also serves to misdirect your attention down to the paper while I am simply looking down under the blindfold and reading the questions. Then before the bandages are removed, I close my eyes again so that I will register a natural reaction to the bright lights as I am freed of my blindfold. This also allows the pupils of my eyes time to adjust so they will dilate, honestly, if you'll pardon the expression, and blink, blink, hey, look at that light, look at that acting. Some performance. But minor league compared to some of the operators in the New Age arena these days. For some odd reason, whole new careers are being created based on the ability to destroy common tableware. You're talking about spoon vendors. Yes. Let's take a look at some additional testimony from Jack Howick, also part of a rare interview we had recently with Uri Geller, the man who made psychokinesis a household word. The technique are the following three steps. I ask people to make a mental connection 
with what they're trying to affect. And that's really quite simple. We do that in our society all the time. By thinking of something, you can make a connection, a mental connection. The second step is to give a command. It's like a, an intention. And we actually, at the PK party, shout. We shout the command, bend. And so uh, that we also do well in our society. The third step is something that we're really not trained to do real well, and that is letting go. You can think of it as a thought form. By, by releasing that thought, letting it go, you, you, uh, it gets out there and, and essentially gathers the uh, energy that gets dumped in the metal. And when that happens, the metal loses its structure, becomes soft, and the people uh, can easily bend it. Or if there's stress in the metal, it'll bend spontaneously. If you go back into the 70s, Uri Geller came to this country, and, and uh, he basically uh, you know, bent a lot of metal. And, and, uh... John Anderson, yes, John. it's nice to meet you, sir. Hi. I noticed you have a new game. I was wondering if yes. we might be able to ask you a couple of questions about it. Yes, of course. That... It's a board game. And if you have questions and answers on um, the new age uh, phenomena. And I think it's needed. There isn't anything like that. Everyone is so much, I mean, look around you, look what's happening in the world. Everyone is into um, mind power, new age, positiveness. You were one of the first people to ever come out with uh, demonstrating mm -hmm. psychokinetic uh, ability. We interviewed uh, Jack Halk yesterday, yes. who is also doing the yes. uh, psychokinetic parties. Do you see more and more people doing that in the future? Yes, definitely. Not only in America, but the world is opening up in everywhere. Everywhere. So, presumably, anyone can learn to perform psychokinesis. This is true, and remember, the key word here is perform. Richard, if you would select one of the remaining spoons uh, from the table here. A common tablespoon, right? Yes, seems to be. It is, except for one small difference. Before they were placed there, I took the time, and it does take some time, to soften the metal by bending the spoon back and forth, back and forth, being careful not to create a ridge where the metal is being weakened. To do it right, each spoon takes about a half hour, and boy, do they get hot. When I prepare them, I wear gloves. Anyway, hold the spoon by either end. Now remember when I ask uh, all of you to uh, concentrate on bending this, well, don't bother. In fact, don't even think about it. Think of anything but this, because it doesn't matter, it's going to break, no matter what any of us think. And another myth explodes before your very eyes. John, you seem to have gone to a great deal of trouble researching your subject. Well, yes I have, but it wasn't any trouble really. I came to Los Angeles some 17 years ago, a seeker. Like many others, then and now, I was looking for some answers. The truth, if you will. During the course of my search, I met different people uh, who seemed to have something I didn't. Something almost mystical. An inner power. A power I desperately wanted. The first example of this power I ever witnessed was a man who told me he could consciously control his heart and pulse then he proceeded to uh, prove it to me. Yes, as many Indian yogis claim. Richard, take my pulse. Okay. Let me know if anything happens. It's, it's gone. How are you doing this? Well, Richard, by placing this ball under my arm and squeezing my arm to my body, it shuts off the arterial circulation down my arm and my pulse stops. Uh, well, what about the stethoscope part? Well, put these on. You got my heartbeat? Yes. Still? It's, it's gone. When I asked the young woman to hold her hand over mine to be sure I didn't pull the stethoscope away from my chest, it left me free to squeeze the tube with my little finger and thumb. 
As a distraction, I had her busy verifying that I wasn't doing something I had no intentions of doing anyway. So when I squeezed the tube and cut off the sound, the heartbeat went away. Don't feel too bad. It fooled me once upon a time, too. In fact, all this stuff did. One thing I was particularly impressed with in the beginning was watching a fellow have a brick crust on his chest by a sledgehammer. This is a rather remarkable feat. How can the body withstand such a blow without injury? Actually, it can. not Believe it or not, the center block between you and the hammer is the secret. As the block collapses, it absorbs the energy of the blow. That's it. No ancient secrets or mystical powers. Even as the hammer strikes, you feel little more than the weight of the block on your chest. Now, don't try this yourself. One slip with that big hammer, and you could easily wind up in the hospital. I can certainly see how that could happen. So some of the things you do are potentially dangerous. Oh, absolutely. I carefully prepare for each presentation. But even so, over the years, I have been injured. The point I'm making here is that none of this stuff, and I mean none of this, requires any paranormal powers, period. John, I can appreciate that. But these are shards of broken glass. Nobody can eat broken glass. How do you prepare to eat broken glass? Bananas. Bananas? That's right, bananas, or a slice of bread. You see, before each demonstration, I would eat a banana or a slice of bread to coat my stomach. Then I thoroughly chew the glass into very tiny granules, which would pass smoothly through the digestive tract. I must caution, however, that no matter what the precautions, eating glass can be very dangerous. But the point is, once again, there is nothing supernatural involved here. No one needs any mystical power to do this. One subject I've been fascinated with for many years is psychic surgery. We first started hearing reports of this practice coming out of the Philippines, then South America, and soon other countries and cultures. Psychic surgery is claimed to be the ability to operate on people without the usual surgical procedures. No operating room, no anesthesia, no surgical instruments, not even a sterile environment. Most claim their ability as a gift from God. Although a few psychic surgeons now purport to be channeling a deceased surgeon or spirit guide. But what type of a person goes to a psychic surgeon? Basically, people from all walks of life, uh, from your average blue-collar family member to celebrities and Hollywood superstars. We recently talked with a woman who had gone to Manila and had psychic surgery performed. Well, when I was 18, I went to my physician, and he told me that I had a lump in my left breast. Now, I wasn't very happy about this, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to undergo a surgery, but I did. Now, years later, in the same breast, in the same place, another lump occurred. I had friends, though, this time that said, April, don't go to the doctor. Don't let them cut you again. We've just come back from Manila. We've experienced psychic surgery. It's a phenomena, and it works. Well, I decided to try it. My curious nature got me, and being a teacher, I needed to know if something like this was true. So I went. I didn't have the money, but within two weeks it came, and everything worked out just fine. Now, I got there, and I was allowed to film the surgeries for two weeks. There were two sessions a day in the hotel, and um, each person agreed to allow me to film them. And it was phenomenal. Now, when it came time for my personal healing, they did, in fact, go into the left breast and remove uh, a tumor. And, in fact, from the right side, they also removed some growths that I didn't even know existed. That was pretty graphic. Yes, it was, Richard. Also, Richard, the April 89 issue of Body, Mind, and Spirit, uh, it's a New Age magazine, it has an interview with Shirley MacLaine telling how she had her knees operated on 15 times. And I quote here, uh, Spirit, did the psychic surgeon actually work on you? McLean, yes, I had about 15 incisions. Spirit, did he break into your skin? McLean, yes, of course. If I can direct your attention to the demonstration area, I'll give you a, a first-hand look at psychic surgery.
Well, that certainly appeared to be real. But how's it really done? Well, Richard, contrary to what many people in the New Age movement say that we are God, we're not. We have imperfect eyes, we have imperfect ears, we have imperfect senses. Therefore, the things we perceive to be true are not necessarily so. Richard, hold out your hand. Pull on my thumb. What you're holding here is one of the biggest secrets of psychic surgery, a magician's hollow thumb tip. By filling this plastic thumb with blood and concealing a bit of beef liver in it to serve as a tumor, I was able to create the illusion that I was removing it from my patient's body. Then it was a simple matter of disposing of the thumb tip during my cleanup process with a towel by simple sleight of hand. And just another illusion. Now remember when I seemed to push my hand into the patient's body? Well, of course I didn't. But by pushing against the flesh and slowly curving my knuckles under, it gives the illusion that I'm actually entering the patient's body. When I pull the thumb tip, the blood flows and psychic surgery. That's it. There are variations on the theme, but basically this is the method. This psychic surgery scam is one of the most insidious ways these charlatans have of fleecing the unsuspecting and the hopeless. By the way, you've heard the old expression, physician heal thyself. When Tony Agpawa, one of the most affluent of these miracle workers, needed his appendix removed, did he call on one of his gifted fellow psychic surgeons? No. He checked into a San Francisco hospital and had an appendectomy performed by a qualified surgeon. The next time you or someone you know is approached by a member of a New Age group, remember what you've seen here today. There is no doubt that many of the New Age people are sincere seekers, but there are a great many charlatans out there, phonies who are using the methods I have just shown you to convince converts that they are something they're not. These people depend on you accepting their stunts as proof of their miraculous abilities. Their continued success depends on their ability to deceive you. Walk in the light with your eyes always wide open. In the Bible, in John chapter 12, verse 46, Jesus says, I have come as light into the world, but those that believe in me shall not abide in darkness. Be not deceived. <laughs>